please give a very warm welcome to Helen Sharman. Hey, Helen. Do you want to sit down here? So, Helen, it's a kind of a modern fairy tale. You're listening to your car radio. You hear this advert, want astronaut wanted, no experience necessary. You're working on chocolate chemistry for Mars at the time. In 89, you answer that advert, and then you succeed ahead of 13,000 other applicants uh, to become the first Briton in space, age 27. Uh, when you saw that movie, tell me about the emotions that come swim into your head when, when you think back to that amazing time. Well, of course, I don't feel like it's 25 years ago. It really does feel very, very clear. And I think it's partly because it's such an intense time. Um, it's something that you've trained for for so long, but then finally you're getting to do what you've done in the training for so many, so many hours and repeats before. Um, but it's, um, it all sort of falls into place. And then it becomes quite an enjoyable time, even though... You know, not everything maybe goes exactly to plan, but that doesn't matter because you know how to cope with it and you can just sort of relax and you're part of the process. And uh, yeah, it was, it was um, a, a great day, the launch, and it was um, a wonderful time in space. You know, uh, I remember so many um, little bits of it, but also the whole thing about feeling weightless, you know, that freedom mm -hmm. of just being able to tumble like that. Um, and you don't need to go quickly like on a, course on, a, um, on a trampoline if you're doing a quick tumble because you're going to come back down on the trampoline again. And so, yeah, we can just... I saw you docking with a dollop of water there in orbit. How, how, many, how much practice did it take to do that little manoeuvre? Oh, I think that was a um, bit of bread or something, wasn't it? But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, bread, it's, 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 it's very natural, actually. It's, 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 you adapt very quickly. Um, human beings are really incredibly adaptive. I'd already taken two days orbiting the Earth before we got to the space station. And I think in those two days, it's actually quite, um, quite a good two days. Tim Peake, of course, took only six hours to get to the space station. So nowadays we can do it... Um, if the orbits are li aligned nicely, we can do it much more quickly. But those two days were useful, I think, because I got to feel weightless for two days. And even though I couldn't stretch out and do somersaults inside the Soyuz capsule, you, you adapt, and so you feel it. You know, every time you lift your little finger, your finger has no weight. So the signals going back to your brain immediately tell you how to move and how to adapt. So when you do finally open the hatch and float into the space station, it all is quite a natural movement, and you forget. You know, I can actually feel the seat beneath me, if I think about it, you're mm -hmm. probably not thinking about it because you, you always sit down, but you forget what it's like to actually sit down. Yeah. And it, it was very touching yesterday because, I mean, sadly, they couldn't be here today, but you, you were reunited with your old crew members, Anatoly Arts, Arts Abarsky and Sergei Krikalev, who holds all those amazing endurance records. But it's hard to explain, but there's an incredible bond, isn't there, between you and your crewmates? You go through a lot together. I mean, not just in the training, but also during the launch. Um, physically, you're very close. I mean, really close. Elbows sort of overlap pretty much in the Soyuz spacecraft with all of the spacesuits that you've got on. Um, and any anything that is is not quite, let's say, normal situation means that um, you're overcoming that together. And I think that anything that you do in life binds you, doesn't it? When you've had to really work hard with a, a group of people, um, and then especially if you um, if, if things go a bit wrong and, and you work together to, to get over those things, then it does, it, it binds you together nicely. And actually now, 25 years on, um, I won't say it's just like it was yesterday because we're all, all a bit older and a bit podgier and so on, but it's, it's, yeah, it's a nice feeling to be back with them. I was trying them. to hold it in, actually, <laughs> Helen. But tell me, when you... It, now, Mir was um, it's kind of legendary space station, um, and I remember, gosh, and, and some quite big dramas happened in Mir, collisions, leaks, fire once, and so on. Um, the International Space Station must seem like total luxury compared with Mir. G give us a little taste of what life in Mir was like, say the food and the smells and all the rest of it. So I think the big thing is, if you go back 25 years, it's, it's hard actually to imagine general life every day nowadays. We have communications so easily. Um, even here in the IMAX before we started, you know, all the astronauts, we were all sort of on our mobile phones, checking emails and so on. It's, it's so easy. And nowadays on board the space station, they can do this. They can email down to ground to their families, to friends, to mission control. They've got the, um, a GPS telephone and they've got connections almost all of the orbit. Um, so there's very little time when they are out of contact. So back 25 years ago on Mir, we had no email. 
Um, there was no phone like that. We had to use the radio to contact Mission Control. Um, the food was um, uh, perhaps, I mean, it's still dried even now because you have to take up food that's preserved. So it's cans of food, it's dried stuff. I presume it was very Russian, wasn't it? Wasn't it borscht? We had was there a bit of vodka slipped in there maybe Well, as lots, well? Of, lots of borscht, I'll go that far. <laughs> 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 but yes, but it, it was a Russian space station, as you say, a Soviet Russian space station. So we had Russian food. Cabbage. And, Cabbage soup, so yeah, yeah borscht is sort of cabbage and beetroot together. Um, we had that dark rye bread. Um, it's actually very, very tasty. Um, tomato sauce um, with um, tuna, let's say, with sort of um, a, a dark, a darkish kind of uh, fish, uh, meat and potatoes. And didn't you smuggle up an orange for the Mir crew? So we, we knew that um, so the two crewmates that I was going to meet on board Mir had been there for six months when we arrived. And although they'd been the occasional supply ship, they actually hadn't had any fresh food for a long time. And so we, did, we smuggled up an orange, and you know, it took us. It was, uh, this was 1991 in what was just still the Soviet Union. And really getting fresh food was very, very difficult. And it, it, we worked really hard to find this orange. I mean, I went to a <laughs> number of places. I really did. <laughs> Uh, we finally managed to get it in. We kind of smuggled it, but of course we, we told the, um, uh, the people who were packing the spacecraft and so that was fine, so it was all wrapped up very carefully and it was put on board the, sp the, space, the spacecraft before we launched, clearly. And off we went and two days in orbit and we made sure it was all careful, carefully sort of kept. And we got to the space station and we greeted them with hugs and it was a, a joyful evening. And then the next day we were unpacking our bags and, and I carefully got this orange out and I gave it to Victor Afanasyev, the commander there. I said, look, we've brought you this fresh orange, isn't it wonderful? And, uh, and he said, oh, thank you very much. It's great. It's lovely. And he held it up in front of him and he sort of played with it a bit like this. <laughs> and then he put it away. <laughs> And the, the next day he got it out again and he <laughs> played with it again. <laughs> and for three days he played with this orange and we were willing him to open it up. You he, he he don't smell anything on board the space station, or rather the, the, the smell, the chemicals that make us smell, of course, make us, we, we believe we can smell, we get used to those. So the brain just sort of blots them out so you don't notice the smells. So I was really looking forward to this orange being opened and being able to smell something. So finally, he op decided on the third or fourth day he was going to actually not play with it. He was actually going to open it up. And as he did, as he broke into that skin, that sprink of flavour and the smell coming uh, really right out, out through the space station was absolutely fabulous. So finally, uh, we got to smell the orange and he shared out. So we all had a segment. And I, I remember sort of um, finally sort of chewing one, one segment as I had to go off to begin an experiment. And there was a pip in this segment. And I took the pip out and I put it in one of the little pockets in, in my trousers, forgot about it. And then much later on, um, after we'd arrived back on Earth and I got out my trousers, there was this little pip remaining. So it reminded me you of the You haven't planted it somewhere. Or no. No. And so that sounds like one of the lovely experiences. Um, what, what, what was perhaps the toughest experience you had in Mia? Whoa, toughest time. Actually, in, inside Mia, the, the, the most... A uh, strange time for me was uh, the, the day after we had actually docked and um, uh, everything seemed to be fine and normal and suddenly there was an alarm and the lights just went out. <laughs> and then the fans stopped working. Of course, you need the fans to circulate the air because warm air doesn't rise if it's weightless. Mm -hmm. So orbiting space stations, you suffocate in your own breath if you don't artificially circulate the air. So fans make the air go around. Fans are very noisy. So suddenly the fans went quiet and it was dark. And Victor said, oh, that's OK. We thought this might happen. <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd had a new module had recently gone and docked onto the space station to increase the size, and that was all great and planned. But that module was shadowing some of the solar panels from the sun, and that meant that we weren't getting as much energy in the batteries as we really needed. Now, for two people on board the space station, it was absolutely fine. For another three arriving, that made five altogether, it was touch and go whether or not it would be fine or not. And they were hoping it would be fine, so they thought not to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> when Victor, oh no, we thought it would happen, so he explained, and then, then it happened a few times after that, and I, I knew what to expect after that. So. Now, I notice in the audience we've got lots of young, budding space explorers. So, what, what's the one bit of advice you'd give them to become an astronaut, Ooh. or maybe be, hopefully be one of the first people on Mars, if not the first? C can I go to two? Because it still is, I'm afraid, e even. Um, one day we are going to need all sorts of people, scientists and non-scientists alike, but still the best way for people who are living now, who are young now, to get into space is to just make sure that you're studying science and then later on maybe science or engineering, those kind of subjects. 
But I think the other really important thing is that it's very much a team environment in space, especially these days. You know, very originally, originally we had Gagarin, we had Valentin Tereshkova, um, we had uh, all the Gemini Mercury people who often flew on their own. We don't now. We fly in big teams of people, often international teams of people. And the really important thing is to be able to get on well as part of a team and also the, the tolerance of living in even the space station is relatively small compared to the, the vast space we have on Earth. So it's being able to cope with a group of people under situations that aren't necessarily what you're normally used to. It's a little bit of a hardship, even on the ISS. It's not mm -hmm. quite what we'd have on Earth. Um, and, to, and to be just a normal kind of regular person. Nobody wants to go into space with somebody who's terribly excitable all the time <laughs> or who's really <laughs> depressive. You, know, you want to, to have a normal kind of conversation yeah. and, and not to, to react strangely to odd circumstances. So good teamwork, normal kinds of people, and lots of science. So very last question. We've got your Sokol spacesuit downstairs. What would tempt you to put it back on again and go into what sort of mission would you like to do? Oh, I'd go on anything. I'd say <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Easy to please. Well, look, we're incredibly fortunate to have with us um, a galaxy of Sawyers and shuttle-flown astronauts with us. So I'm going to uh, invite them up in two groups it's, uh, and, and push my linguistic skills uh, to the limit here. But let, let me ask the first um, group of astronauts to come up and sit on the stools at the back. So if we can have Franz Wiebock, Reinhold, Uwald, Ewald, I beg your pardon, Michel Tonini, uh, Jean-Francois Clairvois, and Claudie Enier. I know Claudie's over there. Um, Jean-Francois did three shuttle flights, including a shuttle repair. Claudie went up on, a, I think, the most recent. So sit, take, take a seat. Uh, I think Michel deployed the Chandra X-ray uh, telescope. And now let's get our remaining group uh, of astronauts. Uh, Dimitru Prunariu, uh, Bertalan Farka, Alexander Alexandrov, uh, Ernst Messerschmitt, there's Ernst there, Jean-Pierre Enier and Jean-Luc Chrétien. There we are. And again, we've got some amazing. Uh, Ernst uh, went up in 85 on the shuttle. If you see STS up there, that's the slightly arcane American term space transportation system or shuttle um, and worked on the uh, on space lab. Um, Bertalan, first Hungarian cosmonaut, uh, Jean-Pierre, twice Demir, married to uh, Claudie, and they both have children and an astronaut named in your honor, although you weren't sure about that this morning, Claudie, but I'm, I'm assured that it's the case. Um, so let me just start off with uh, Dimitru, uh, first of all. Um, you uh, went up to Salyut 7, Oh, six, I beg your pardon, um, which I think was the first um, non-military um, Soviet space station. Now, we've been talking about how Mir was not very luxurious compared with the International Space Station. Salyut 6 must have been quite a tough uh, assignment. Um, you're also the president of the Association of Space Explorers, and you've all been meeting here today. Just tell me a little bit more about the ASE. Actually, all of us here, we are members of the Association of Space Explorers. This is the only professional and educational association of quite all astronauts and cosmonauts of the world. We are now about 400 members from 37 countries, from a total number of astronauts and cosmonauts of 547, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, we organized this association having in mind the fact that we have seen the earth from up there we have seen its beauty its fragility and at the same time we just feel that this earth needs our protection our protection of all of us not only of us of the astronauts and just to promote this idea just to educate the new generation and just to debate between us on professional uh, problems, topics, 
we organized in 1985 this Association of Space Explorers. In the beginning, we were only 25 from 13 countries. Some of them are here, me, Bertie, Jean-Luc Chrétien, and uh, now, as I said before, we number about 400 from 37 countries. Each year we meet in different countries, organize planetary congresses, and uh, meet people, students, uh, researchers, and promote the idea of uh, approaching space for peaceful purposes and to study as much as possible in this uh, field of activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now let, let me just ask a couple of questions to um, our distinguished guests sitting on, on the stools. Um, you know, either something you had to fix, a problem uh, you had to fix or overcome in your space mission or something that you'd like to see in the future of uh, space exploration. Um, perhaps um, given that, Reinhold, you like um, amateur dramatics, why, why don't we start um, uh, with you? What, 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 what's, what was the one tricky thing you had to do with on your mission or, or what, what's your future vision thing? Well, um, I, it's really on amateur level, so I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 um, well, uh, astronauts, cosmonauts on board of the space station, they are all in one. They are housekeepers, they are scientists, uh, they are their own moderators for their own t TV shows. and So um, the, the, the time is very short to prepare these things, to to get adjusted and uh, hearing Helen talk about her flight immediately brings back that memory as well. Uh, and it only functions because we were a very good crew. We had, uh, I had four Russian friends uh, that I flew with. Uh, I had an American astronaut at that time on board of the uh, Mir station. So everyone was looking into how to run the space station. And we had three control centers that were talking to us on a link that was just line of sight. Can you imagine? So it was no satellite link possible at that time with the Mir space station. We had to share the uh, VHF uh, link while we were flying over uh, Russian territory at that time. And so communication was literally down to maybe 15 minutes maximum of, uh, of talk and, uh, to, to per, uh, and only for a couple of orbits. And then we moved out of the, of the way. So you can imagine that communication is a, is a big thing. And... Uh, even playing in an amateur uh, theater group <laughs> does not help <laughs> when people don't see you. And uh, this, this went very well. We, we got all our programs uh, done in, in a very short time, in three weeks that I was up there. I'm still thankful for the friends that, that helped me uh, to have a, a good scientific program, keep the contact with the ground, and still follow their own uh, work. And this is the spirit that we are flying International Space Station as well today. So um, I, I notice um, we've got Franz, uh, who I think is uh, Austria's first astronaut. And Franz only astronaut. And only uh, astronaut as well. Uh, so Franz, what, d tell us about, you know, your, um, ha give us a, a glimpse of what, where you see this great human adventure leading us. Well, I, I, I'm going to tell you a little personal adventure I had and a very emotional experience. Um, First of all, uh, I had a shocking experience today when I looked at, at this picture here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I see Helen, you know. She almost looks younger nowadays than 25 years True. ago. He, he was always <laughs> very, very smooth. <laughs> well, and then I look at myself and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so for those who are wondering, yes, that's, that's really me. <laughs> and... And also this year, I have a 25th anniversary in October, 2nd of October. So we had our launch, and the launch was going very successful. And everything went smooth, and then, then we went to our night shift to sleep. And uh, first thing next day in the morning, Mission Control was, was waking us up, and they immediately called me, uh, you know, to, to communication. And I thought, oh, what's happening? Because, you know, that was not planned, that I, I need to talk to them. So I thought, what did I screw up? Uh, but actually, I received a very nice and beautiful message that I was becoming father the day before, after the launch of the rocket. My wife just saw on TV, she's sitting here, uh, she was watching the launch, and then 
you know, she was going to the hospital to have <laughs> her lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that was, of course, a very emotional moment for all of us. Um, then also in, in, the, in the space station when we met uh, the others. And we had a very, very good time. Uh, and, and this certainly contributed to the, to the success of the whole mission. And then one additional uh, very nice thing. I had a very, uh, let's say, uh, much softer landing than my group mates because I was very lucky and landed in the seat of Helen. She was bringing up the spacecraft and the seat, uh, which I was then uh, fortunate to, to sit in and, and land on land. Thank you, Helen, again. So, Claudie, so that's my story. Th thank you. Thank you very much. And now le let me ask, Claudie, you, you were a delegate for research. You went into French politics and so on. Could you give us a sense of the, you know, the political dimension of this? Where do you, do you think the future of space lies? Timing in now here in, in the UK, political. Yeah. <laughs> in UK yeah you're in not France. allowed to talk about Brexit, OK? But, <laughs> but, um, but, but do you... Do you some, uh, when I look at people talking about the future of space, some are talking about private buccaneers like the Elon Musks, and others are talking about huge cooperative ventures with every country on the planet involved. Well, wh where do you think, uh, where, where would you like to bet uh, on our future? Um, I, I think, really, I, I had a dream when I was 12 years old after having seen the first landing on the moon. So I became an astronaut. I had the chance to have a mission on the Mir station, a second mission on the International Space Station, and now I have a dream. I've always dreamed, but I think that's important to have dreams. That's to see maybe in the near future, the follow-on of the exploration, not only in low Earth orbit, but the future of exploration, and why not to assist or to be part, I have a dream, I say, to assist, to the first landing of villagers on a moon village with a crew including female in the moon village. That's my dream. Very so th that means very open one, uh, as you say, it's not a question of politics. It's a question of uh, the future of uh, humanity. Exploration yeah. is the future of humanity. It must be done with all the contributors, different users for different purposes. That's the follow-on of our conquest and progression. And uh, the Moon Village is a, a nice idea, and uh, I think that's a dream we, we may share. I must admit, I was dreaming of a moon village as well in, in 69. Let, let, let's move to uh, Jean-Francois. You, you went up three times uh, on shuttle. Um, tell us about w the, the trickier moments in your mission, or tell us your, your, your vision of where the great space adventure is taking us. On the first mission, it was quite fine. It was a mission to study the atmosphere. So we were flying upside down the whole time, and we were upside down in the orbiter to be upright relative to the Earth, looking at the Earth through the roof windows. And when I was uh, exercising on the bike in the cockpit, the orbiter being upside down 90 degrees uh, of the velocity vector, the Earth was moving in the same direction of my biking. I had really the feeling that my <laughs> cycling <laughs> on the ergometer was making me <laughs> <laughs> going around the Earth. It was very international. A French astronaut was flying a Canadian robotic arm to deploy a German satellite on board the US space shuttle. <laughs> the second mission was to resupply the space station Mir. Uh, I had organized an international uh, dinner on board, and for three hours, we had the food from all countries represented by the crew on board. We had Michael Fall from uh, UK. We had Elena Kondakova from, uh, from Russia. We had uh, Ed Lu, uh, US astronaut, but uh, from Chinese origin, uh, Carlos Noriega from Peru. Uh, it was very nice. We had foie gras, cassoulet. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we even went to the cinema. When I went into Mir, I saw uh, these uh, hundred of uh, VHS cas video cassettes. And I told Vasily CBF, oh, we can even go to the cinema here. He said, yes, you tell me when you want. And we set up uh, a movie, and we, we watched a movie there. It was uh, very nice. 
Uh, so you so thought they a had a tough time in orbit. They're lazing <laughs> around. A, a great mission for, for humans. I mean, <laughs> when you open the hatch, and all those who have docked to a space station, when you open the hatch and you see your colleagues waiting for you, sometimes for months, and you, we almost cry because it's very emotional to, to reunite people who train on the ground and have not seen each other for months. And the third mission, uh, I feel it as a mission for science with a big S, to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, it's uh, twice higher than my first altitude, uh, my first mission altitude. And, and when you touch the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a European, American cooperative uh, project, not only US, as many people think, uh, you feel that you serve the quest for knowledge, which is one of the, the main destiny of humankind. Thank you very much. And just finally, Michel, just, just tell us a bit about you're, you were on a shuttle mission, uh, again, with a scientific objective, launching the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Were there any tricky moments there? Well, the, the mission um, had a problem because we broke uh, one of the main engines at launch. The third engine on the right had a piece of metal of about 10, 15 centimeters that fell down. We didn't know that, but uh, we had three holes on the nozzle and therefore we, we lost the uh, hydrogen from these three holes. We knew it uh, before, uh, when we arrived in orbit, because we were lower than the, the normal altitude, we were like uh, 10 kilometers lower than normal altitude, but we knew after, after the following day that uh, the controller on uh, Houston was checking the temperature of the right nozzle and we were high, 70% higher than normal. But at the same time during launch, we lost this piece of metal and we had the full, uh, AC electrical short right after electrical current, and therefore we mm, we had to shut down the 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 computer of the protection of the main of the, the three main engines, and because of this failure of the so computer, you had to override your safety system in effect. Is yes. that right? Yeah. And and because we had this double failure, we didn't have a compensation of the ratio of hydrogen and oxygen. Therefore, we went to the normal altitude. If not we would have been obliged to land uh, somewhere in Europe or to do a ATO, which is about to orbit. So it was a difficult mission to get up, but we finally get up there and we deploy the telescope uh, and it's still working very well. Well, I think, uh, you know, on this stage, we've had Alexei Leonov talking about the first spacewalk, um, which is just the most amazing story uh, that he managed to get back in one piece from that. And I think now is, is a great time to open up to the audience for questions. Um, now, Helen, you said that um, young astronauts need to know about the STEM subjects, but our very articulate um, <coughs> panel today have also showed us something else. And I know in Europe, people will often say, people who speak two languages are bilingual, People who speak more than two languages are multilingual, and people who speak one language are English. <laughs> Should we also <laughs> be having more, um, more emphasis on learning other languages? I think Tim Peake said one of the hardest things for him was learning Russian. Yeah, I think learning Russian certainly was one of the hardest things for me as well. Um, to think who's, um, so who would like to answer a question about English language? Maybe actually um, Dorin, who's um, actually fluent in Romanian, French, Russian, English, of course, um, um, uh, pr speaks also Hungarian my and, my, my and a number of my others, okay, Hungarian, his wife. So, um, but uh, perhaps on behalf of everybody who's, um, yeah, who, who, who's here who might, might be wanting us to s the English to speak a little bit, bit more foreign languages. Uh, okay. Um, in the school, I learned French and German. And when I was selected for a space flight, I was 25 years old. And uh, our officials told us that, uh, guys, you have to go to a star city in Russia and uh, to be prepared for a space flight. And I asked them, okay, but uh, how many translators will come with us to help us? <laughs> and they laugh and they said, you have to learn Russian. <laughs> wow. Uh, we started in Romania for two months before going to, to the Soviet Union that time. But I, I know that uh, I barely learned how to write with the uh, Cyrillic uh, letters and to understand a few words uh, and to express uh, uh, very simple things. 
Then we went to Russia, and uh, they took note that uh, after about two weeks of uh, teaching us a lot of uh, very complex space things, uh, that we just look at them, uh, smile, and uh, understand uh, just words, nothing else. And then, of course, they organize uh, a very specific professional lessons of Russian with us. And it's hap it happens with all of us. We had very good teachers and we learned Russian very professionally. Uh, we learn uh, grammar, we learn uh, literature, and so we learn a lot of things. So that we could speak Russian as the Russians do. And then after that, so when I went at the international level, uh, I've seen that, okay, I have to speak English. And I start to learn English. And now, okay, I use three main uh, languages at the international level. I work uh, very much with the UN, and then I need Russian, French, English. Uh, I'd like to know Chinese, maybe Spanish, uh, some other languages, but I don't think I have time to learn all <laughs> of these languages now. <laughs> So that was my experience with Russians. Let's, uh, let's have another question. I think we've got one uh, right over here to, to Helen. Um, when we l I'm listening to you, it seems that these years haven't taken a, um, a lot of time in your minds. It seems very proximate, that time that you spent there. But I'm curious, how do you think that you would... Um, represent, what do you think that you've learned in those 25 years looking back? How would you have answered um, a question about what we need now and what we need then? How, how has your perspective changed, do you think? So I've certainly changed in terms of um, how I, uh, I've, I've learned to talk more about uh, science in a, in a different way, I think. And people have taught me um, a, a way of communicating, which is um, certainly when I've gone into schools, teachers have advised how best to talk about science. Um, but yes, um, times change and we, we all grow with the times. I mean, perhaps I should throw that question actually to, to somebody, perhaps um, Jean-Lou, you've, um, you've been um, you're perhaps one of the, the, the earlier fires in this group, um, there was, um, one or two flew before you, but you've also seen many changes over the last few years, um, many changes in terms of what, what, what ESA wants and what France wants, because France has had its own program quite separately to ESA as well. How, how, how do we move with the times and, um, and, and, and learn to communicate in different ways? So you, you mean that uh, I should talk about the difference between the selection uh, so many years ago and, uh, and today, what we suggest to these young people, so what they are uh, expecting, what I they should expect. I think the question was, was more, um, over the last 25 years, how have we changed as individuals How have, in terms of our perceptions on, is, am I right in terms of what, what's happening um, and what the kind of things that we do talk about? Um, do you talk about the same things um, to a French public audience now that you did when you flew, for instance? And, um, what do we keep saying to young people when they uh, tell us uh, would like to become an astronaut? Uh, and, uh, what, what do you suggest? What would you are and um, to be curious, but probably uh, one of the qualities um, astronauts have to meet, one of the conditions that we have to meet uh, to get selected, to show that uh, we are interested with uh, anything, and um, to try to perform every day a little bit better than uh, the performance of the day before, and uh, which means have a kind of spirit of competition, but not to be in competition with others, because that's boring for mm -hmm. the others. A lot of people think that we feel like being in competition, and we are not. We are not in competition with each other. We are uh, supposed to work as a team, as a crew, as a crew member, but we need to be in competition with ourselves. And that, again, I repeat, that uh, to try to perform better today than yesterday. And, uh, and maybe the last one is uh, to be uh, passionate. Most of us here who have flown several times um, have waited many years between each flight. And uh, it's a long preparation, but the, prepa the preparation doesn't last on the time that has uh, been the years that have been between two flights. So 
Um, you spend many years stealing the system, the space system, working, expecting that you will fly again, but having to perform in, uh, in the technology, in research, whatever, um, is interesting for the space uh, science, and you need to be able to do that and be passionate. I think let's have another question. I think we've got um, we've got a question over here queued up, so far away. I think that's right, isn't it? Or am I getting ahead? I thought we'd handed a microphone. Go on, put your hands up again. Sorry. Here we are, that <coughs> gentleman there. Uh, hi there. Um, I just have a question for all of you about what your feelings are on space tourism. So at the moment, you're all <laughs> members of quite an exclusive club. Uh, <laughs> and uh, a club of explorers and adventurers. Uh, do you feel like space tourism might uh, adulterate that somewhat, uh, that wonder? Or do you think it might just invigorate and push people to, to go further? So I'm wondering who's best to talk about space tourism? Um, Ernst, possibly? <laughs> well, I can uh, answer this uh, to this uh, question. Uh, of course, it uh, takes a lot of energy to go to space. Uh, we need rockets. And you have to imagine that um, each uh, rocket uh, delivers only 5% of its mass to low Earth orbit. And that has uh, definitely a certain impact uh, on uh, the um, composition of the upper atmosphere. I don't think uh, that we get to a large extent uh, tourism to space. Uh, we have been learning also on, on Earth that we have to protect certain environments. When you want to go to um, Galapagos Island, uh, you not just go there, you have to take everything with you back. And you have to pay a few th uh, thousands of dollars uh, to be able to get to that island. So we have to learn that not every, uh, every millionaire can... Uh, should be uh, brought in a position to do something because he is a millionaire. But we have to think about uh, protection of Earth, of the environment. And I believe that on the long run, it's uh, more for specialists uh, that work in low Earth orbit uh, as a sort of an infrastructure for science, uh, like uh, uh, science uh, for uh, in the weightlessness uh, condition or uh, uh, new uh, transmission systems for uh, internet, uh, navigation systems, etc., and exploration further deep into space, back to the moon, to asteroids, to Mars, that should be left uh, for, for those who have a good reason to go there, for getting um, knowledge, new knowledge, getting uh, technologies um, to increase uh, the horizons, and also for the, in, in general, of course, for the benefit of mankind. And we have to prove uh, for each mission that it, it's worth uh, doing this. And I think Franz wants a word. <laughs> um, well, let me ask the audience, if you would have the funds, who would like to fly to space? Oh, look at this. Wow. wow. I would say 95%. <laughs> Guys, we need to get the other 5% also. <laughs> <to> <laughs> It's our meeting room. I know you said you wanted to ask everybody. We don't have time to get every, everybody to answer. But we had a, a meeting of, of our group earlier on today, and one of the uh, comments that was made was that if you ask one astronaut a question, you'll probably get three answers. If you ask 20 astronauts, you'll get 60 answers. So each one of us <laughs> would give you a different answer, I'm sure. But you, you have one opinion there. I think we've got another question up here, far away. Здравствуйте. Oh, that means hello in Russian. <laughs> Um, I was just watching your film earlier, um, Helen, and um, I just want to ask you really practical questions. First time I've ever met astronauts, so I'm t I'd just like to know what it feels like when you land, because you looked a little bit wobbly. Wha what's your actual physical feeling when you land back on Earth? Spasiba. Thank you. That's great. Well, you feel incredibly heavy and often a little bit dizzy sometimes. Sometimes it's just difficult to get your balance a bit and feel a little bit faint. Um, I'll give you a quick answer because, really, I think we've got so many people here who can give you perhaps a much more full answer. Um, I know Claudie is a, a medical doctor, so perhaps you might be best, Claudie, to, to say a little bit more about what, how you feel when we land um, and perhaps why that might be. 
I, I think we we may differentiate two con two different situations: the short duration mission for two weeks. So that's true. And Ellen said that that uh, uh, it's uh, astonishing the um, how quick is the adaptation of the body to this situation of wetlessness and how quick it will be in return back on Earth, so a few seconds or minutes uh, where you are not completely comfortable with uh, the gravity and the, the way to walk, but everything is okay in a, in a few minutes. This is for short uh, duration mission. And for the long duration mission, and I'm sure you are aware that a few weeks ago came back from space uh, uh, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko after a one-year mission. Mm -hmm. So in order to, to know more about this long duration and the adaptation of, uh, and the preparation for the future for Moon and Mars. And the truth is that after this long duration mission, you must be um, a little bit fragilized, I would say, by the adaptation to the situation of microgravity. Even if during the flight you had two hours per day making exercise on treadmill and uh, a lot of, in order to, to get fit, to keep fit uh, during the, the stay on orbit, at the return after this long duration mission, the time of rehabilitation is, uh, I would say, rather long and progressive in order to get your force in your muscles, the quality of your bone, the adaptation of your cardiovascular system. So th that's a lot to learn about this situation of microgravity, to learn for our pathology on Earth, uh, or the difference of physiology between uh, different situations, and also to prepare the future because the, uh, the mission will be long mission for um, the next steps. Mm -hmm. So Tim Peake, of course, will be spending about six months in space altogether. Yeah. So after he returns, how long do you think it will be before he's totally back to, let's say, to normal, before space flight? Does it mean to be totally uh, normal? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think if you want to look uh, closely to the bone, for example, the quality of bone, so it's, it is said by the scientists that you will need uh, six months to have the rehabilitation and recuperation in this, uh, I would say, microscopic level of the, the, the bone quality uh, to be fit. Uh, uh, he, he did a marathon, uh, I think, about um, I cannot say exactly <laughs> how fast he can make a marathon. Well, I think he did about three and a half hours, didn't uh, he? Did uh, yeah, he was, it was a good time. We, we have uh, progressed there. I, I, I think we have progressed, and you see the progress in the young generation of astronauts that are flying right now. They use a device called ARED, which is an uh, advanced device of over the treadmill and the velocipede, uh, the uh, ergometer that we had. It's using bungee cords to uh, to put force on your body. And I've seen really people <coughs> uh, after a six months flight um, on the day of the landing return to uh, their crew quarters upright, waving, smiling, much in better condition even than I was after three weeks. If we take a quick look on what's going to happen to Tim, he will be uh, met by uh, rescue forces in the, in the middle of uh, Kazakhstan. In the step he will be taken by a helicopter to the next airport and there uh, there is a crew plane, a NASA crew plane no normally that takes uh, the, the NASA astronauts from directly from Kazakhstan uh, to the US. But um, in Europe we, we do a detour. They will be landing in a, in a Scottish uh, airport to refuel and will be met by a, a, by a plane that ESA, the European Space Agency, sends there. And then uh, Tim will be coming into uh, um, a rehabilitation center in Cologne. So that's what we call direct return. This is a new scheme. We spend our time in Star City, the uh, American astronauts in Houston, but the European astronauts now uh, go through that uh, rehabilitation in um, uh, Cologne in a specialized center. And this is a, a huge progress, and it, it's much quicker, the rehabilitation, than it was for our uh, flights. I think we've got time just for one more question. Um, let's, uh, uh, okay, we've got one just down here. Go on. Fire away. Oh, good. It's a younger, <laughs> younger member of the audience. This is great. They're fighting over the microphone. Uh, how, how long did the training take, and did you think it was useful? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think if none of us had done any training, we wouldn't be here anymore. So I, perhaps <laughs> this is a really, really quick one. So we blast our way along the front line and then along the back line. 18 months, yes. How long your training? Three years. And was it useful? Very, very useful. <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I did a full cycle of training. It was just the schedule of our space flight. We started training uh, in 78, and I was scheduled to fly in 81. Some of us were scheduled in 79, in 80, so I was scheduled in 81. So keep, jump keep the microphone yeah. moving. Come on, let's. Uh, it uh, took me a few years. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so from beginning to first flight, how long did you have? From the be very beginning of training? From, from the selection to the flight? Yeah. Uh, 85, 93, eight years. Well, and, wow. and was it useful? Uh, not always. I mean, <laughs> 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 I don't know if you have seen the, uh, this mo uh, English um, American movie uh, where uh, the astronauts are trained for the moon, and uh, they are attached on uh, on on a seat like that, and there is a simulation of fire before them just to see their psychological reaction, and sometimes they put a needle in the top of the hand, and the astronaut asks the uh, the uh, doctor. Uh, is that really useful? Uh, wh what is that for? And uh, the doctor said, I don't know exactly, but uh, I think it's no, it's no use. <laughs> <laughs> After uh, selection, uh, I had um, two years of training for a space lab mission um, with uh, 70 experiments. And I thought it was uh, too short to understand all details, uh, in fact, in, uh, required. So um, I would have liked um, much more training, uh, like we have today, uh, four to five uh, years before you go to the International Space Station. That is Bertie from Hungary. Uh, thank you. <coughs> uh, <laughs> this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> it was 36 years ago, ago and uh, after the selection, I was in Star City mm, only two, day, uh, two years. And for us, it was very, very interesting because uh, we flew with Russians, cosmonauts, and the Russian language for our group in the program Intercosmos was very, very <coughs> um, important. And I flew, uh, I was in space only eight days. It was very fantastic for me, no problem. Wait list, this is good, very fantastic, this is unique. Uh, the landing was very dangerous because we have <coughs> the ground 1G. In centrifuge, we got uh, 8G. I was a military fighter pilot, no problem, 9, 10G. Some mm, very small seconds, maybe. And uh, during our landing, Kubasov and me get no about 45 G. This is really very, very fantastic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Go on, get so we're going to quickly, Jean, uh, Jean Lou, do you want to very Jean quickly, Louis. how long your training from, from, so begin from selection to first flight? Very quickly. So for the first flight, we had the same training, it was 1980, so it was a standard. Russian uh, training, so one year of theoretical uh, courses and mostly learning uh, Russian language. And then the sec second year was uh, more practical. Uh, but uh, again, it uh, was a standard training group that we all had at that time. On the second flight, uh, the we had uh, I had an EVA uh, schedule that we performed on board the Mir. Training was a little bit more different than the first one. And the EVA training takes uh, takes a long time, and uh, and even uh, though we had uh, that training, that nice training for the EVA, we got uh, problem during the real EVA. We couldn't close the door of the um, of the uh, transfer uh, module, the, the door, the outside door. Uh, we couldn't close it, so uh, and we had no training for that, and we had uh, to use our imagination to find a solution. And this, is a ver this was a kind of a close call. So the question was, what did you do? How did you actually... I'm sorry? The question for shouted out, how, how, what did you do to fix it? Um, 
So the, uh, uh, the cosmonaut, the Russian cosmonaut who went out before me, told me um, I have attached the handle that you use to open the door and close the door. This handle was a kind of free handle. So he said, I've attached it with a long rope, a small rope, with a, a thin long rope, so that in case when you get out of um, a mirror, that handle gets out of its uh, uh, place, at least it won't fly to space, because if it happens, <laughs> then uh, you won't return. So he told me I had a good idea, I did that. So uh, while I was turning that handle, and the first time the door was not in the right position, so uh, it was really not closed. Then the second time it happened again, so what's, what's, uh, I was ready to turn back, and then I would not be here today to tell you the story. And then suddenly I remember, I said, oh, the, the rope. And in fact, because it was very dark and my helmet was uh, covered with water, um, the rope was really around the handle, and, uh, and that w was why it was uh, blocked. And, uh, it was kind of a miracle that forcing on that handle said, okay, fine, I broke the rope of the Russian cosmonaut, and now we have a door closed. But I was really very close to do it again, the wrong side, and then would not be here today to tell you the story. Wow. And the wow. third flight, I mean, it is already late. I passed. Uh, yeah. So this is Sasha. So I think we're going to be running out of time. So a really interesting story from Jean Lou. So very quickly, how long was your training? And was it useful? And Alessia is helping <coughs> us. Yeah. No, I got over two times. I was training twice. The first time the training was just for one year. It was a spaceship Soyuz. Second time was a year and a half. On the spaceship Soyuz TM and space station Mir. Every training had its own special features. And I really liked the fact that we studied various experiments to show how people can sleep to go to Mars. Because without sleep, a human being can't survive without for 10 days. And the trip to Mars is very, very long. <laughs> That's why we did one experiment per month on Earth. We took 16 criteria, heart, brain, eyes, and so on. And we did some experiments during the flight, and when we came back, another month of experiment. And scientists predicted that a human body can uh, rehabilitate itself during sleep. And it was true. And it was true because there were three stages during the sleep, deep sleep and two additional stages. That's why there is a road to Mars, and if you want to, you can always go. Fantastic. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I think we've, we're going to run out of time, so if these people wouldn't mind, I'm going to ask Ryan Holt, who I did my training with in Star City, so we kind of got to know each other quite well, but he had a particularly um, interesting time, let's say, on the space station, yeah. for which I think the training <coughs> was, well, no doubt saved his life. <laughs> yes, I trained within seven years. I trained uh, twice, one and a half year in uh, Star City, and um, well, there are trainings that you look at, it's very important, and others that are more comical, and we did the fire training 
uh, on the mill station and we were dressing with the gas mask, but the, uh, the tube that led to the oxygen uh, container was always cut off, so you looked like elephants uh, moving through the, the space station. But this was the training I used most because we had actually a fire on board of the mill station uh, on the 14th day of, of uh, three weeks flight. We had to fight uh, an oxygen candle exploding uh, in, in the station and you cannot just open the windows. I mean, you, you uh, uh, or, or call 112, I learned it's 999 in Britain. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to help yourself. And we were all in gas masks within seconds and, and uh, were able to uh, extinguish the fire. And you can imagine uh, the trainer that taught us this lesson, he was eagerly awaiting us uh, back home. And he was the most gratulated man in Star City that he saved the station. Wow. Okay, one final sentence from, um, from France. You're going to school, right? And uh, I'm telling you, training starts right there. Okay. And most of it is useful. Yay. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> what a great note to end on there. Please give Helen and this galaxy of brilliant astronauts a big hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you, guys.